It's finally time to review the new book by Armando Calvo, Christ Righteous Ministries, A Conscious Universe, which from the title you might assume is about panpsychism, but in fact is a book of Christian apologetics. The title is styled in Anaglyph 3D, which I can only assume was done for my benefit, thank you. I don't know why this isn't more common, it's as if publishers discriminate against people with 3D glasses for eyes, but the subtitle is The Incredible Cause That Had an Amazing Plan. Again, based on the title, you you might assume that this refers to the universe, but in fact it refers to the Christian God. Below the subtitle is a galaxy brain meme. Although it's not a galaxy, it's the Veil Nebula, so I guess it's more of a nebula brain meme, but that doesn't sound as impressive. I figured out that it was the Veil Nebula by searching space art on Google, although I don't think this is his exact image. And I found the skull by searching skull brain art on Google. Oh, and I found the space shuttle by searching for spaceship art, and then finding one that looks kind of like it, like a black and white line drawing clip art thing, and then clicking this one that looks even more like it, and then clicking see more under related images. It worked the first time. I didn't even bother to search space shuttle art first because I thought the word shuttle would be expecting too much. Now, I'm quite certain that I could go on like this and find every single image on this cover and also in the entire book, but I lost interest because really, who cares? I genuinely don't care that he's done this. It may not be the wisest idea in this context, in a book that you're selling, but eh, I'm a YouTuber, you know. I didn't make every single element of every one of my thumbnails either. Although he did specifically say, I created and designed the full cover myself. Um, I love getting very artistic. Yeah, but you didn't, though. You didn't create the full cover yourself by any means. You made a collage of other people's work. Kind of like this thumbnail that I made for a video about you, with the dinosaur doing the jobs and the dogs and the lions having the weddings. I didn't create this full thumbnail myself. I did a fair amount of photoshopping to get that hammer and hard hat onto the dinosaur, and the dog head and the lion head onto the bride and groom, but it's basically the same thing your cover is. It's a collage of stuff that I found on Google. Now, I would accept that you designed the cover. You made the choice to take all these elements and put them here in this configuration to create this effect, but you didn't create them. Come on. And then we got the back here. Um, as you see, it's not verified. There's no copyright down here. And then we got the back here. Um, as you see, it's not verified. There's no uh, copyright down here because I haven't got it. Um, I haven't got it verified like this one. Don't worry, Almondo. I'm sure it's still copyrighted somewhere. I don't know who we have to telegram to find out about it, but I'm sure somebody knows. Now, the text on the back cover is a little hard to read at times because it's very light, and a lot of the background is also very light. And especially because there are all these little white spots because of the stars, parts of the text that are little white spots, like periods, commas, are sometimes obscured. Now, I've already gone through the back cover text way back in November, you know, back when Almanda was originally going to release this book, and nothing's changed since then, so I don't see any need to go through this again. Oh, and the text on the spine is still printed upside down. Its author is apparently Christ Righteous Ministries, despite the fact that the front cover says it's Almando El Calvo, and the full title does not appear on the spine. It just says ACU. Of all the things to find space for on the spine of your book, that seems like the most important, but apparently Christ Righteous Ministries disagrees. The title page says, WARNING! This project may contain graphic imagery. Viewer discretion is advised. That's unexpected on the title page of a book of Christian apologetics. I guess whatever that's referring to, it'll probably be pretty obvious when we get there. Now, I'll tell you something that'll make you very sad. We no longer have a table of context. Now, unfortunately, Almando has learned the word contents, and now we just have a page titled Contents. I'm sad too. The numbers on the contents page are actually correct, and completely unaligned with each other, creating this wavy line effect, which I don't believe was intentional. The chapter numbers and titles use a nauseating combination of bold impact and regular Playfair display, and the last three of them for some reason are glowing and pulsating and calling to me. The inside formatting of the book is very much like the last one, if somehow a bit less consistent. 
Justified text is apparently still a complete mystery to him. He uses a combination of different fonts. Most of the book is in Times New Roman, but occasionally he switches to a different font. Occasionally he also switches the font size. And as for the line spacing, I'm not even sure it makes sense to say what most of it is, because it switches at random between double spaced and 1.5 spaced. The introduction is written in a completely different font to the rest of the book, that being double spaced 12 point spectral, which being a fairly formal looking serif font is just similar enough to Times New Roman to be confusing to the eyes and head when you flip the page to chapter one. Now, the first sentence Elmondo writes in his entire book, other than the graphic imagery warning, is Before you begin this incredible and informative book, I'd like to introduce myself. The first line of the whole book is absurd self-congratulation, and frankly, what else did you expect? But you know what? Maybe it's warranted, because this book consists entirely of brand new, totally unique, never before heard from anyone, arguments for God. Everything is unique, everything is new, and everything is original. The material in this book is are going to be arguments that you have never heard and that are irrefutable. Why? Because even for the time being, these are new, fresh, new arguments for the existence of God and the reliability of the New Testament. These are fresh new arguments, arguments that have never been heard from any apologist, and uh, arguments that have never been heard before. I have to say, that's a pretty impressive achievement, so maybe he's right to pat himself on the back. Now, I haven't read the book yet, so I haven't confirmed if everything is unique to Almondo, but he said it was, and we all know what his word is worth. My name is Almondo Calvo. Getting strong Kent Hovind PhD dissertation vibes off of that. Hello, my name is Kent Hovind. I have been blessed to receive the gift of a ministry known as... And then the font size goes down one point for some reason. Christ Righteous Ministries. Yeah, not to be a dick or anything, but you have a YouTube channel nobody watches. That's your ministry. That doesn't exactly strike me as a gift from God. He says his job is to, you know, argue for Jesus and God and whatnot. And then he says, I am convinced of this conclusion due to many hours of dedicated research and study. Yeah, sure you are. I believe you. That's been abundantly clear from all your videos and books up to this point. Through many forms of scientific, archaeological, historical, logical, and precise in-depth investigations. Something about that last one stands out to me as not quite like the others. The first four are categories of investigations, and the fifth one is just self-congratulation over how thorough they were. Through my experience, I share the ultimate truth of reality to expand the wisdom and knowledge of others who seek truth. Again, this guy has an enormous opinion of himself. In his videos, he said a few times that he started taking Christianity seriously something like three years ago, and it's pretty obvious from everything he's ever done that he hasn't researched anything. And yet, this is how he speaks of himself, as the bringer of the ultimate truth of reality to expand the wisdom of others. It's a little bit cliche at this point to bring bring up the Dunning-Kruger effect, but this is such a perfect example of it that I just can't help myself. So before I really get into it here, just a couple of notes. Firstly, this is largely meant to be a book to convince atheists that God exists. It's arguments for God's existence. But as we've seen in previous videos, the author doesn't think atheists exist. He thinks everyone already believes in God and just lies about it. He's said that if you've seen an argument for Christianity and you didn't just convert, you're by definition dishonest. And that if you split apart the word atheist into a and theist, that says a theist. So you're a theist. Everyone's actually a theist. So my question is, if there are no atheists, if everybody in the world believes God exists, isn't this all a giant waste of time? Isn't this book and your last book and every video you've ever made arguing on this topic completely pointless? But oh well, it'd be completely pointless anyway, so never mind. The other point is that Almando has challenged atheists to debunk every single argument in his book for a $50 gift card. I'm gonna put up maybe a $50 gift card, Amazon gift card, okay? Um, for anybody who can completely destroy every argument in every chapter of my book. 
Now, of course, I'm not going to bother with that. This project's already way too big and long-winded without trying to debunk every single thing he says. But hey, you know, if I thought there was a chance in hell of actually getting a $50 gift card for my effort, maybe I'd try. But at this point, I couldn't even tell him I'd done that, unless I posed as an ice cream delivery man and served him my video like divorce papers. And speaking of papers, minutes before I uploaded, I printed out a copy of my video and proofread it with a red crayon, and then FedExed it to the copyright for official verification. Verification, so, you know, look out for that seal of approval in the near future. Now, I would say on to chapter one, but those glowing chapters, they really were calling to me. And I'm guessing that's probably because of what Almondo told us here. Okay, I'm at chapter seven. I got three more chapters because my target is ten. I'm like, I don't even know, like, I have no idea what to write another chapter about. And by the grace of God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, whew, he embedded some information within me, and I was just like... All right, I got this. I'm on a roll. Ba, 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 ba. I was literally at that point. I had no idea what else to write about. But by the help of God, I mean, I was able to put in some awesome, awesome, awesome content. So, And I did say that the first thing I'd do is go to these chapters. That's where I'm going as soon as I get that book. Chapter 8. I want to see what low-effort filler writer's block Elmondo sounds like. I want to see how the hand of God writes a book. So I guess I gotta do it. I would have liked to put it off, but I might as well just get it over with. I have to do it sometime, and if it's gonna convert me, well, putting it off for a video or two isn't gonna mean much. So, I guess I've reached the end boss of my career. That's right, I'm about to debunk the very writings of God himself. Wish me luck. Chapter the Eighth. Self-Destructed. He starts with the Big Bang, under the heading Big Boom, and gives us a quote from Two scientific astronomers, Andrew May and Elizabeth Howell. Now, Andrew May is an astrophysicist, and it's arguable that these days that's basically the same thing as an astronomer, but Elizabeth Howell most definitely is not. She's a Space.com writer with a PhD in space studies. He doesn't say where this quote actually comes from, and he puts it in bold instead of block quoting or even just using quotation marks, but you know what? He's presented it clearly as distinct from the rest of the text. It's clear that it's a quotation, and he told me who wrote it. It's not perfect. If it were anyone else, I would be saying, look, you gotta fix this. But at this point, I'm more than happy to accept that. If this is the kind of thing we're gonna see through the rest of this book, that's a huge improvement. Almondo underlines infinitely hot and dense single point, inflated and stretched, and more measurable rate and says, Notice how the explanation only explains a theoretical effect, but not an actual answer to what caused the heat and inflation of the universe. Which is correct. This Space.com article is not concerned with that, and neither is the Big Bang Theory. What exactly the initial state was like, and what caused it to be that way, really isn't relevant to the theory about what happened after that initial state. It's very similar to how biological evolution explains the diversity of life, but it does not explain the origin of life, because that's a different question altogether. Heat has to exist in a spatial atmosphere. Spatial atmosphere. Spatial atmosphere. Yeah, I got no idea what he thinks that means. But as for the article, what's really meant there is just shorthand for energy. And the idea is that if you put any finite amount of energy in a zero volume area, the energy density is infinite because you're dividing some number by zero. And while this zero volume infinite density idea is common, like in the popular consciousness, it's probably not correct and it's also horribly outdated. What's clear is that inflation occurred, and that the energy of the universe was far more dense than it is now, to the point of looking very little like what we're used to now. And everything before that point is just flat out unobservable. What this actually looked like at the start, if you want to call it that, isn't clear, but the zero volume thing is just what you get if you assume that the decrease in volume as we go back continues all the way down to zero. Actually zero, not just a really small number. But just because that assumption can be made, it doesn't make that assumption true, and these days that assumption really isn't made. That whole idea is super old school cosmology, it's from before the idea of the initial inflation period, and all it seems to be doing at this point is confusing religious people. And and a lot of other people too, as you can tell from the article. Heat can only arise with a high temperature source. But what exactly could that source be? Something of a self-existent quality, an eternal substance of some sort. 
sure, could be. Something like a very small volume space-time with a bunch of energy in it that has nowhere to go because there's no there beyond it. It can't just dissipate its energy away into something else the way a hot air compressor dissipates its energy into the surrounding world after it's done compressing. I find it plausible enough that something like that could be eternal. Obviously, though, me saying it's plausible doesn't mean I think it's true. I'd need some reason to make that leap. But we can agree to consider it true for now for the sake of this discussion. How or why could this pressure of heat become an explosion? And where did the materials of the explosion come from? Pressure of heat. Okay, if what you keep calling heat somehow applies pressure to space-time, then I guess the answer to how it would explode is from the pressure? And as for where the materials come from, didn't we just agree to consider this primordial space-time and energy something eternal and self-existing? So that's where it came from. But I'm kind of losing track of what we're talking about here because we're not talking about an explosion. The Big Bang is not an explosion, it's an expansion of space-time. And then you're bringing pressure into it like we're talking about a balloon? In order for something to explode, there must be a material mass by which the explosion derives from. I would agree. An explosion is something that happens to matter and energy within space-time. It's not a change of space-time itself. And that's why I find it so frustrating when people keep calling inflation an explosion. Here we see yet another victim of this usage of the word, unable to understand what's being discussed because people who should know better keep telling him we're discussing something else. Neil deGrasse Tyson did that in Cosmos. Space itself exploded in a cosmic fire. It never stops, and it never stops being annoying. It's not helpful as a simplification. It doesn't help people understand the concept better. All it does is make newcomers think, well, I know what explosions are like, and that doesn't sound like it makes much sense. And yeah, you know why? Because it doesn't. What exactly inflated and stretched? Was it the heat and pressure? Okay, but in Almando's case, it's his fault. Inflated and stretched are perfectly fine, and the article he quoted makes it extremely clear that explosion is misleading, and goes on to say, and I quote, It was an expansion of space itself. I would have said space-time itself, but fine. Good enough. This shows us very clearly that Almando's quoting the article without ever having read it, because otherwise he wouldn't have this question, he would have already got his answer from the article. If so, then how could inflation of heat and pressure cause materials to erupt out of a non-material mass, with no resources to derive from? <sighs> Okay, leaving several possible criticisms of your phrasing aside, what do you mean no resources? Matter is energy, and we're talking about something containing a massive amount of energy. What more resources do you want? Where did all of these materials come from? If the argument is cells... It... what? Then where from and how did cells erupt just from heat and pressure? What are you... cells? What? Why would cells even enter a discussion of, I guess, the, the origin of matter as we know it? Subatomic particles, atoms, in the early inflation of the universe. What are you... What, where is this coming from? This is like asking if the answer is toasters, where did toasters come from? The answer's not toasters! Why would the answer be toasters? Or cells? How does that question even make sense to you? These questions are unanswered. Well, yeah! You wanna know why? It's because contrary to popular belief, there are stupid questions. And stupid questions don't get answers, because answering them is stupid too. But even with that, atheists seem to justify their position even with the lack of solid information and evidence. Do we assume the heat and heat pressure are cells? No! No, we don't. No, I, I agree, Almondo. There's absolutely no evidence that this heat and heat pressure of yours are cells. And fortunately for my sanity, there's also absolutely no evidence that anyone but you ever had the idea that they might be. If that's the case, then heat wasn't the cause, cells were. But where did these cells come from, and how are they alive and moving? Living... <laughs> living, moving cells. I have no idea, man. It's your idea. You tell me. I'm not going to try to come up with some way it makes sense. I don't see a way for it to make sense. But I guess I'd better go find one, huh? Because apparently this is what atheists are supposed to believe. This brings us back to an eternal, living, powerful, and personal source. A source that holds the weight of solid explanation. God. <sighs> okay. 
solid explanation. There was just a God and he just wanted to do stuff and he could and because he just could and then he just did it because, you know, somehow. Problem solidly solved. You know what? Somehow, even your ridiculous heat pressure cells idea is more believable than the one you actually believe. I mean, at least we know there's energy and things have temperatures and there are cells, at least now. These are things that we know exist and do stuff. It makes no sense to mash them together the way you did, but still. What we have is cells that caused heat pressure and resulted in an explosion that expanded, inflated, and stretched across the grid. Across, across the grid, okay. I think I see your problem. You've missed the point that what's expanding is the grid. And now I feel I should clarify for poor Almondo that the grid is illustrative and that we're not referring to an actual grid. I just know he'd fail to understand that. Resulting in a mass effect of planetary order and life with a measurable amount of precise numeral arrangement and structure. Giving us what we now have is order, life, and intelligence. So I just want to be clear. The atheist position is that before the Big Bang, there was an infinitely dense singularity full of heat and heat pressure, but also that heat pressure was a bunch of living, moving cells, and these cells caused the heat pressure, but also possibly were made of the heat pressure, I'm really not sure. And then these cells made materials, or maybe they were materials, and the materials then literally exploded like dynamite across a grid that was just there, and the explosion caused a mass effect, like the sci-fi space travel field thing in the video game. Except here, mass effect means the formation of planets and life, and then there just was intelligence. Is that a good summary of what you think atheists think? You know, never mind, it's not even worth starting. Seriously, there's no point. Just keep going. Fuck it. Wow, this is incredible! I might just become an atheistic scientific astronomical nincompoop myself! No offense, but this system seems to be extremely hard to justify and confirm, due to the lack of logical consistency. Yeah, it's funny how easy of a time you seem to have just making up stuff that completely lacks logical consistency. You've clearly had a lot of practice. Heat in a state of eternality with no sense of purpose, goal, mind, will, or conscience. And here he has an incorrectly used semicolon, which is his favorite way to use a semicolon. Causes the most incredible, intelligent, purposeful, orderly, vast, precise, and logical effect ever. He also really likes his long lists of features of stuff. So we're still on this heat stuff, I see. But as for effects differing from their causes, and interesting properties emerging from energy and physical constraints, I get that it's confusing if you have no idea what anyone's saying, which you show you do every time you open your mouth, but the only person who can help you with that is you. Now I could sit here for thousands of hours and just read books to you going into any process that you're interested in to the finest level of detail, and which explain how each of those processes came to be understood. But why? You would never listen to that. You didn't even read the article you quoted from at the start of this chapter. You don't even just listen to people when they tell you what you keep saying I believe is nonsense, and it's nothing like what I believe. As far as I'm concerned, what you need to learn is not anything scientific. That's way down the road for you. What you need to learn is just that your deranged fantasies about what other people think aren't necessarily what other people think. But even just trying to teach you that is pointless because you don't care if anything you say or think is actually true. So maybe even before that, you have to learn to actually give a shit what's true. This definitely proves atheism. Almondo, in no way would a sensible explanation for the origin of the universe or its features prove atheism. It would close some very significant gaps that people hide gods in, but that's not the same as proving atheism. Why should it do that? Who claimed that? Whether inflation has a god at the start or not, it's still inflation, and that's what you've been talking about. That's not even an atheist idea. There are plenty of religious people who accept cosmic inflation and its implications. What you're taking issue with isn't atheism, it's science. Because you're still butthurt that the universe isn't 6,000 years old. An easy solution to that would be to stop believing that the truth of your religion is subject to the age of the Earth, but I guess where's the fun in that? This definitely proves atheism. It proves atheism to be utterly and logically unwise. And then he has a tab, as opposed to a space. 
I would assume that he meant to hit enter and then tab to start a new paragraph, because a new thought starts here. But he forgot to hit enter first, and then he just never bothered to fix that. The trouble with that is, he doesn't put tabs at the start of his paragraphs. He just starts all of his paragraphs flat on the left side of the page. So, I guess he just wanted a tab here. For style? This happens multiple times through the book. Now if heat was the ultimate cause of the universe... Incorrect semicolon? Time, space, and matter. Then the source of heat must also be timeless, spackless, and immaterial. Yeah, as you can see, he meant to have a comma there, but instead he put a period halfway through the sentence and then kept going as if it was a new sentence. This happens several times throughout the book. Anyway, this is in addition to his claims about what atheists believe. Apparently now we believe that heat caused not only matter, but space-time. As if energy existed without space-time and then just made space-time later on. I have no idea who, if anyone, believes this, but never mind. That's what atheism is now, so you better get used to it. He describes what the source of this heat must be like, but again, didn't we already agree that for this discussion the original substance is eternal? So if that's the heat, then the heat has no source. It's eternal. But according to the explanation of the Big Bang... Incorrect semicolon. I gotta stop pointing these out, there's way too many of them. Heat is not spaceless. If heat inflated and expanded, then the heat and pressure itself was not spaceless. Uh, yeah, I agree. Obviously I'm not even bothering to worry about the word heat and I'm just treating it the same as energy, as I'm sure you can tell. It seems to me energy is something that exists within space-time. Maybe that's wrong, I don't know, maybe it can exist beyond space-time, whatever that means. But that's my understanding, in which case the energy doing much of anything without space-time doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Of course, nothing here can make much sense, because apparently the assertion here is that it wasn't space-time that inflated, but heat in the total absence of space-time, and then eventually there just kind of was space-time. It was limited to a sector. A sector outside space-time, mind you. Apparently, outside of space-time is divided into sectors. Sectors of what? Who knows? And expanded due to its provoked temperature. So the heat wasn't that hot, but then its temperature got provoked and then it got hot. And expanded inside its spaceless sector, and then eventually something-something space-time. That means heat was restricted to a single point and bounded by a source outside of its exact radiation. Oh, the sector was a point now, so a zero-dimensional volumeless singularity. But it could radiate, so the singularity was a sector of non-space-time, full of heat that was hot, but not that hot yet. And this singularity had a boundary that was made by, or made of, something outside the singularity's radiation. Hey, maybe that was the space-time. Maybe, maybe, okay, maybe space-time was outside the heat sector radiation singularity point ball thing holding the heat in, right? But then eventually it pushed too hard or the heat got its temperature too provoked. And then, so the heat got pushed through the wall and then was inside the space-time now. And then it lived inside the space-time like the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. <gasps> hey, cells, it all fits. And if heat was timeless and without control, then there would have been timeless amounts of great galactic explosions throughout an eternity. So if the heat existed outside space-time, and so time didn't apply to it, there would have been galaxies exploding all over the place. Timeless amounts of them. I didn't even know there were galaxies in the sector. I thought the sector was a zero-dimensional point. How could a galaxy fit in? I thought there was just heat inside. But these galaxy explosions, which, remember, they're literal explosions of matter like dynamite, would be timeless. And so timey words, like, say, rapid, wouldn't apply because rapid implies a duration in time, which there wasn't, and so the timeless amount of exploding galaxies would, I guess, have to be zero because explosions are rapid, timey events. Things that only make sense in time. Well, if I were to guess a number that's in Almondo's head when he says stuff like timeless amount, zero's the one that had come to mind first, so I guess that makes sense. Nah, still makes no sense. Wait, aren't galaxies material though? Where do the cells come in? Are the galaxies the material the cells made? In other words, we wouldn't be here. What, because of the galaxy explosions before the universe? I don't know that that'd have much impact on us. I could see you saying we wouldn't be there, in the spaceless, timeless heat sector, being crushed by space-time and timeless amounts of exploding galaxies. We wouldn't really do well there, I'd imagine. But we'd be here, right? You know, after the cells did their thing, and the heat got 
space timeness and then blew up. Uh, I don't remember anything we've been talking about. Please teach me more about the Big Bang. There's so much about it I didn't know. The origin must be the source by which all heat and pressure derives from. There was a source of the timeless eternal heat? When did we figure that out? Is that even coherent? And that source must be the ultimate cause of all creation. An eternal, powerful, personal, intelligent, and willful being. A being such as God. And it turns out it was God all along. God made the heat, and the exploding galaxies, and made the heat hot, and the cells, and all the rest of it. And here I was thinking Almanda was arguing against all that heat and cells and galaxies stuff. No, of course not. No, it's too good of a theory. No, he just wanted to shove God in before the heat cells. Well, hell, you could have just said so. I'd be happy to jam whatever you want in there before everything you just said. Because it's not like any of it makes any sense anyway. <laughs> you know, I really, really, really hate to use the Billy Madison clip here. That meme was old and tired years ago. And I don't even like the movie. But... I'm sorry. After something that rambling and incoherent, I feel compelled to. Unfortunately, I know exactly what's going to happen if I do it, which is that this entire video will get demonetized for me and monetized for some gigantic movie company. So instead, I'll just read the script for that speech. What you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. There, that works. You know, I hate to say it, but in this particular case, if anything, that clip is an understatement. I mean, at least Billy Madison's puppy story was vaguely coherent, but your last couple pages were like a fever dream. They read like an actual Mad Libs. You've taken cluelessness and strawmanning to undreamt of new heights. Next, we have a multiverse theory. Oh boy. Will this be worse than the Big Bang? Sorry, Big Boom section? No. No, it will not. Nothing could be worse than that. Everything else in this book will be better than that, just because that section was the worst it can possibly get. It's the absolute zero of apologetics. So it's all uphill from here, folks. He cites a live science article now. He loves live science. It's by Paul Sutter, which he does specify. And he gives a URL of simply livescience.com slash multiverse, which I assumed wouldn't work, but shockingly it does. And Almondo explains Sutter's article in his own words, by which I mean Sutter's own words, with no hint whatsoever that it's a quotation. So bizarrely, even though we have a reference to the source and the author, this is still plagiarism. This happens many times through this book. It seems to me Almondo has partially got the point, but missed large parts of it. I suppose he's to be commended for kind of trying to improve. Although I don't really know why I'm talking about him right now, because of course these chapters were written or inspired by God, I'm not really sure which. Just like the Bible, really, this is basically another Bible. So, if anyone's the plagiarist here, it's God. Which I guess explains why Almondo seems to have very little concern about this issue. If God doesn't see a problem, he doesn't see a problem. That's how it works. But what exactly does this prove, then? Uh, nothing, really. It's a summary of the idea, not an attempt to prove the idea. Rather than disproving the existence of an intelligent being, he in fact encourages the possibility of an intelligent being with the ability to create a multitude of different universes with a purpose, goal, and direction. Okay, sure, you're welcome to think of it that way if you want to. If you want to turn the multiverse into just another convenient gap for you to fill with God, go for it. Doesn't make it true, but hey, it's a free country. This does not by any means dismiss the case of God. Okay. What gave you the impression that it's supposed to? It's meant as a possible explanation for certain observed features of reality. It doesn't address the God question at all. It might have implications for it, but that's not the point. So now Almando takes nearly a page for a very long quotation from the same article, and he makes it extremely clear that it is a quotation from that article by first saying that this is what Sutter said there, and then putting the whole thing in italics to indicate that it's a quotation, which is great! I'm not going to quibble over the formatting of the citation or the italics or anything. This is good. This is all I wanted. Clear, unambiguous distinctions between what's coming from Almondo and what's not, and an indication of where and who it comes from. Even if the way it's being done here is a bit non-standard, this is not plagiarism. If he'd been doing this from the start in God Is and this book, the word plagiarism would never have come up. 
Of course, all these statements and ideas are nothing more than a theoretical guess, but notice how even if this was the case, you still have a beginning to the whole show. Do you? How do you know? Based on what? I'm not saying you're wrong, but you're also giving me no reason to think you're right. You're just claiming you have this knowledge as though you know everything about everything. I just can't get over the arrogance of that behavior. This theory doesn't explain the actual cause of these effects. Mm, I'm pretty sure it does. The details are a little beyond my pay grade, but it's a bunch of quantum stuff. Did you look into this at all before you decided to write it down? Or did you just assume that the theory doesn't explain this? It makes a guess and tries to explain the possibilities of different effects that could have occurred, to try and explain our universe and why it is the way it is, while also assuming that every other universe has laws and intelligence of its own. No, different laws of physics maybe, in some of them, or a lot of them, but certainly not all the universes would have intelligent minds in them. In fact, probably most of them would be little micro-universes that never started inflating, so of course there'd be no intelligent minds there. But still neglecting the fact that in order to have complex order, precise design, intelligence, consciousness, and life, there would need to have been a source that possessed these qualities to be able to place these values exactly where they are needed to be. You say that sort of thing a lot in this book, but you never actually try to explain why. It's just an assertion that you make all the time that you insist should be taken for granted. But why? There has to be a why. More importantly though, this spot in particular is the dumbest place that you could possibly write it, because if there's an infinite or extraordinarily large set of universes with basically every configuration of a universe possible, you would end up with universes containing not just all of those things, but every possible configuration of those things. Not only would it be possible without this source you insist it has to have, it would be inevitable even without it. But that would interfere with their theory, and most likely cause a problem with their hypothesis. So this bald assertion of yours, with no argument supporting it, of some rule of reality that shows no sign of actually being true or required, would cause a problem for the hypothesis to which it bears no relevance at all. Sure. Their job is to do away with God and promote the wisdom of man. Their job? Whose job? Scientists? No, their job is to figure stuff out, and if sometimes that means God has one less gap to hide in, that's not their fault. That's the believer's fault, for basing their beliefs on nothing but knowledge gaps and shrugs. That behavior of the scientists, of trying to figure stuff out without just muttering God and calling it a day and moving on, isn't a product of trying to do away with God. It's a product of wanting their ideas to be backed up by something, justified, grounded in reality. If the arguments for the universe as you'd like it to be can't provide that, well, get better arguments or start asking yourself why they can't do that. Well, that's it for this part of Chapter 8. In the next video, we'll continue Chapter 8. Now don't worry, this is not going to be a 20-part series. This chapter is far and away the densest of the chapters. You know, God had a lot of ideas. Not good ones, but ideas nonetheless. Once we're done Chapter 8, the video after that will cover two chapters in one, in a video that's shorter than either of these Chapter 8 videos. So they're really not all like this. But for now, thanks for watching. And if you would, please give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. And if you like these book reviews or anything else I do, please do consider supporting the channel. A couple bucks per video or per month is enormously helpful. And as always, huge thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, sign up to the email list, list.logic.com, and I'll see you next time.